leave the door open. Someone wants to come in. Um, feel free to, even if I'm talking about a car room, so feel free to get up, walk around, move around, and look, you know, while I'm talking. It doesn't matter, you're not being disrespectful or anything. Just, you know, it's, a lot of this stuff uh, needs to be looked at, and, and as I said before to a lot of folks, the carvings are one thing, but it's, it's, it's the stories behind them that, that I find interest people just as much as looking at the stuff. So, uh, but I did bring some, and uh, these, these are, uh, I'll start by just talking about uh, endangered species. I've carved maybe uh, a dozen, and uh, I brought what I can lift. <laughs> so, and uh, to just kind of summarize on the endangered species part, I have an interest in starting an endangered species gallery, and I've tried for about two or three years now to find a place, and, and it's just very difficult. And uh, I've, I've talked to everybody you could mention, you could think of an endangered species uh, organization and mention it to me, and I'll tell you, I talked to them. <laughs> but uh, the gallery idea is, is one where uh, not only are the carvings there, but it, it's a learning experience for the whole community, for the local colleges, for the local high schools, not only the fact that these species are endangered, but this is the oldest art form in the world, chisel and hammer. I use no machines, just a chisel and a hammer. Uh, I, I can't find a screwdriver because they all got points on them. <laughs> uh, and behind them are high-tech digital posters. So what you have is the most ancient art form in the world combined with the most high-tech digital art form together and uh, so colleges and high schools that are studying digital uh, have them come down and uh, look at the carving and they've done posters for me and these posters actually are six foot by four foot and I've reduced them just to bring them here but um, then the biology department studies the species They'll look at this item, do a woodpecker. They'll study, they'll research why they're endangered, where they're from, how many are left, what's being done to help them, um, what's our involvement with it. And then the English department comes in and takes all that information and puts it in the first person on the, on the poster, such as, uh, I am an Ivory woodpecker and was declared an endangered species since March 11, 1967. Currently, we are listed as critically threatened. And, and when species like that, I am a mountain gorilla, welcome to my show. I, I have one mate and four or five young ones in my lifetime. And when you hear species talk like that, mm -hmm. it really puts it on a, a scale that you, uh, you can identify with. And um, so, uh, and I started with, with the endangered species because I'm just going to throw out the idea that if you know anybody that's interested in having a museum, let me know. <laughs> but, but there's a man, uh, it, I consider it an endangered species, and I've just added another one, and that's uh, Woody Guthrie, right there. I consider him endangered because there's hardly any folk artists anymore. Where did they go? How come there's no you know, uh, Guthrie's? And there are, but not as a, as a group, you know, they're, they're here and there. But uh, I consider him a danger. Um, let's see, here's a, a rhino, a white rhino, this is. Um, and, and, and it's really sad to, on the one hand, to read why they're in danger, because that horn in the front they use for medicine, and you know, they're willing to kill the rhino to get that horn. So the way we got to deal with it is uh, shoot the rhino with a, a tranquilizer, cut its horn off, and then it comes back to life and they won't kill it because it doesn't have a horn. <laughs> Very sad. But um, in the outer door woodpecker, there's uh, Cornell University declared them so endangered that they refuse to accept any poster, any pictures or videos of them because they don't want to make it look like they made a mistake. In their declaration, but there is now a ten thousand dollar reward for anybody that's a document. 
their existence. Uh, hello, hello, and uh, hello, and man, now, now this, these posters, if you get a chance, read, read the posters, because that's, especially the one about man, because it kind of puts the whole show together, if you read this one. And, uh, Those are the endangered species. Man, there's an eagle. This, this I, I uh, donated to the New Hall First Nations tribe in British Columbia. They have it sitting outside of the van building. Uh, rhino, man. There's a brown pelican, which I call BP for brown pelican, and British Patrol. Did the oil spill and almost <laughs> declared an extinct. And this is a monk seal. And what's funny about this one is I got done carving it and I'm looking at it and there's a like a crack on its, on its head here and I'm thinking why are baby seals why are they in danger because we club them and, and that, that, that would bite I didn't do that that was intended <laughs> and, and this is the uh, American crocodile um, this is the ivy good woodpecker and that's how tall they are Two feet tall, these woodpeckers. And I don't know how you could not see one if it was near you. <laughs> and of course, there's a, a silverback gorilla. Um, and up, up in British Columbia, they call them Sasquatch. I mean, it's like Sasquatch. And, and some folks won't even come to our house up there because if you've got an image of Sasquatch in your house, he's going to show up. And let's see if there's any other. Uh, there's back in the corner back there's a wolf, full size wolf. Part, and, uh, I think that's, that's the species of here. here. Okay. All right. So that's that's the endangered species part. Well, like I said, feel free to like. I'm going to try to talk closer. We get it over the seat. Just walk around and, and, and read these, uh, especially that one. Okay, let's see. I'll start over here. And the one thing I hate to sell my stuff because it's, it's, I sold one, the uh, Give Peace a Chance card. You know, there was an eagle cradling the dove. And uh, I'm running down a road trying to buy it back for $500. <laughs> so I stopped, I stopped selling it. But I, so I got an idea. And uh, I went to, to, to Lumberyard, bought silicone, 100% silicone, called for windows, and I cover my carvings with it. <coughs> and I end up with a mold. Nice. Oh, pulled off, and now I make these, and I've made, and I use this, I've put these in uh, masonry work, like on a, a fresco, I'll put, put these, and uh, and what's interesting is on these are painting and painting the stones. I've painted some stones, but what I discovered was if you use acrylic paint with stone sealer and mix it stone sealer with your paint and then paint it on there, it'll never wear out because the stone sealer sucks that paint into the car, not just on the surface. So. I've had carvings for 30 years and they look the same. <laughs> so, but that's, I started making castings and that's one. Was it, there's a fish, there's a fish over there and a turtles and things I carved that made into mm -hmm. castings for, for such. And, um, so that's, that's that, and this one here, this one. It was like my sister in law, I didn't try it. <laughs> <laughs> and that's the first uh, face I caught. That one. And this one, this one else, and you have to excuse my getting into like things that we might not be aware of or uh, some kind of action oriented talk or something, but I, I feel it's like just something that. It's in, in me that I have to talk about it. And this is one. This, this was carved 
at the gates of Fort Benning, Georgia, and down in Nogales, Arizona. I took his stone down. And uh, at, the, at the School of Americas, I don't know if anybody's ever heard of the School of Americas in Fort Benning, Georgia, but they've since changed their name to uh, WINSEC, Western Hemisphere Institute for Security, because they were getting flat. So that, that's how they changed their, they just changed their name. What they do is, and, and have done for decades and decades, is they train all of the military and police forces south of the border in all the countries, Central America, South America, Mexico. They come up to Fort Benning and we train them to torture. We have book, books of torture discovered there. And what their purpose is, is to go back to their countries and ensure that dictatorships run their countries. Why? So our corporations can freely go down there and establish themselves and the corporations get rich the, the country, the dictators get rich, and the indigenous and the, the regular folk turn into the slaves for these corporations. So when that, but what happens is when that coffee picker gets his head smashed because he's not picking enough beans, we're convinced that that coffee picker is our enemy. And in reality, the, the problem is oh, we, we've uh, we've initiated the murder of. Bishop Oscar Romero in San Salvador, seven Jesuit priests, raped and murdered nuns, uh, killed 43 indigenous folks, the Las Abejas group in Chiapas, Mexico, uh, indigenous Christians who were praying in their church, we murdered 43 of them, and we just murdered Berta Caceres, who was an uh, indigenous chief in Honduras, who was trying to stop one of our corporations from damming the Orinoco River for electric so they could put in a mine. And it, the, this Berta and her, her tribe had been there 10,000 years. They murdered her and they were just found guilty. But the bottom line is no one knows about this. Our, our congressmen must know about it. Our representatives must know about it. And, and all we talk about is building the wall, the, the, the crisis at the border, Every day, the crisis at the border. But nobody mentions that that crisis, Honduras, under President Alea, was a democracy. They had free health care, free college education, no drugs, no crimes. We initiated a coup, take him out, put a dictator. They lost their health care, they lost their college education, drugs, crimes come in. What are, what's the Honduran people doing that are now oppressed? They're getting in caravans to come up here. Don't blame them. Yeah. And that's what's so bizarre is that it's, it's so, we're talking about the, the, the symptoms of millions of people at the border. That's a symptom. That's not the problem. That's the result of the problem. You know, let's deal with the problem and, and, and get ourselves up. Now, I'm, I'm a member of a group called the SOAW, School of American Watch, and Two or three countries have been convinced to not send their troops and to Fort Benning for this training. So we've helped in, in some aspects, but it's still a long way to go. And and that's uh, but this this is uh, to explain the carving. This is on one side is the School of America's watch, and the ancient tribes like the Inca, the Aztec, the Maya, the Olmec, the Nazca, the Koji. Who, who formed these countries down there. And um, what's happening is, is, is uh, the School of Marys have killed thousands of people in these countries. So this is, these crosses represent them. And there's a group called Presente, which means still alive, still here. And this tree is, is welcoming all the people who were killed back up into, back to life where they're saying, yeah, basta, enough. And they're smashing Winsett. No months, no more, no war. And they're smashing the SOA. Justica, for justice, come along. And, and that's the other side of it. But, um, yeah, and uh, at the gates of Fort Benning, when I go down there, and, uh, there's like 10,000 people. And on Sunday, there's a march where everybody picks a cross up with somebody's name on it who was killed. And it takes the whole day, Sunday, to march with these crosses and put them in the fence of Fort Benning. 
And by the end of the day, the whole fence, you can't see through it at all. It's just covered with crosses. And it's so sad. It's like, it, it's an incredible experience. And, and, and there's still no explanation as to why it's done. You know, but we all know. As I'm carving, I come across pictures that just blow me away with, with uh, the way these, and I've saved them, and then I put them all together, and it's like, look at these kids. These from uh, Nepal, from uh, Tibet. This is my daughter, my granddaughter. He's, he's from Iraq. This boy's from Honduras. This lady and her child's from Cambodia. And this lady, little girl's from Madagascar. Look at those kids, and look at those parents. How do we go from there to these kids killing each other? You know, well, what's that a, a symbol of for us as, as people on this planet? What do we, why is it tolerated? Why is something like that not respected, admired? And we see these kids growing up, these kids are gonna go after, the, oh, these, these girls are from uh, British Columbia, the Newhall nation. And, and it's, it's just, it just blows me away to see, but this, when I look at them, I see the beauty in, in these, these children. And uh, that's hopeful, that brings hope. But at the same time, it's sad to think what's happening to them. Yeah. On a lighter side, this is, uh, anyone ever read The Hobbit? You know, that's Gandalf and small. And it's funny because when we grew up, our, our kids' high school was the Cameron Dragons. And so I'd, I'd make molds of this, and I'd take the dragon, and I'd hang my daughter, who's, the, who's over there, was the, the uh, cross-country champ. And uh, I'd hang that on, a, on the trail, over a tree, over, over the top of the trail. <laughs> <laughs> the race was over, I went to get it, it was gone, so I'm going to get it. And this one is Wheeling. I worked in Wheeling for a while, and I really like Wheeling. Wheeling is like a big city on a real small scale. It's, it just, what they have there is incredible. And, and they, they were the beginning of so many things. You know, the Faustoria glass, uh, the country music, the square nail factory. Marsh, the cigars, Marsh Wheeling cigars, Greyhound <coughs> dog racing. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's all Wheeling. And, and, uh, and this, I had a show at the Art Center, uh, Artisan Center in Wheeling. And uh, this is their symbol. It was, it's on the building. Uh, and, and I got an idea. So, well, maybe I'll carve that symbol. They have to buy it. <laughs> and they did, they bought it. It's sitting up there. I figured they, they, they can't just let it go out the door. <laughs> so but that's, that's in Wheeling. And over here is a, this is a wedding gift. And this is the first carving I did. And, and I call it a bird's nightmare because it's a bird bath. But the tongue is transforming into a snake and it's got a bird oh. in its <laughs> But it kind of looks like, to me it looked like Aztec or something, yeah. you know, but that, that was the first carving I did. Over here, my sister's father-in-law went to Italy and if you look up in the corner, there's a picture of what her father-in-law father saw in Italy and it was a, it, it's a naked lady looking, looking out the window with the curtain. And uh, he went by her a few days, and she's still there. Yeah. So that's a window. The Italians got a stone the same size as the rest of the windows, carved this, took it to the second story, took the bricks out, pushed that stone in, and it just looks like the rest of the windows. And <laughs> but that's Italian. The Italians were very free wheeling. I mean, nothing beyond their thinking. And so that's what prompted me to carve this cat in a window because this is a stone the same size as the windows. So, but I didn't put a naked lady up in the cat. <laughs> Here, I don't know, uh, you can see it, it's, it's uh, up in my woods for years. 
the, the stones looked like a fish. I couldn't stand it anymore. So I went up and carved this fish going in and out of the ground. And uh, I had a hunter come down from the woods and say, Ron, I saw you carving up in the woods. It's beautiful, but who sees it up there? I said, well, you just did. And, and the other thing is, what, what it made me think about was the fact that a lot of people, artists, individuals, uh, think of creativity in different ways, you know? Like, a lot, uh, most people wouldn't do this because there's no money in it. There's not, you know what I mean? It, they're creative as could be, but if they don't, don't see it as perpetuating their life, then they don't go for it. You know, they'll go for something that's real plain and little, bring them money, you know? And, and that's okay, I mean, that's, that's the system we're in. But this, I see, is just creativity for creativity's sake. Yeah. Um, see, this one is uh, a broken heart. Uh, uh, Daniel, this, this fellow named Daniel, he died in Iraq. He was killed in Iraq. And his mom, his mom's sister, which would be Dan's aunt, was telling me that his mom has locked herself up in, a, in her bedroom and won't come out. And the whole family's worried about her. She's, they used to be really close families. And so I carved her that heart with her son coming out of the grave, holding it together. And, and his wife, who just had a baby before he was killed, holding it together. And her husband's on the other side holding it together. And, and, um, and I sent a little note saying, uh, may the love of your family uh, help heal your broken heart. She sent me a wonderful note back, but um, that's, and this one I got a hillbilly buddy. <coughs> this isn't him. This is, <laughs> this is, this is his, his best buddy. <laughs> and uh, yeah, fights cocks. And, uh, I don't agree with it, but on, on the other hand, he told me, he said, Ron, if, if it weren't for, for fighting cocks, that breed of chicken would be extinct. And it's like natural selection. And they are beautiful. These birds are just incredible. And uh, so I carved that. And back here against this wall are the carvings that I did up in British Columbia, some of them. And uh, this one is for the uh, Mack family, New Hulk, N-U-X-A-L-K, New Hulk First Nations tribe. And uh, their name was Mack, and their family was Wolf, whale and eagle and i show people and i'm going to show i'm going to ask all of you uh, where's the wolf well it's obvious okay where's the uh, eagle well it's obvious where's the whale i showed them and they did the same thing they knew right away that the whale was the shape of the wings yeah. and you're the first person that knew that <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>
carvings. Um, there's a Norwegian community up there that's, um, because it looks like Norway, the fjords, north of Vancouver. If you look at it, it has a lot of fjords and inlets, and uh, the Norwegians really were smitten with that area, so there's quite a few up there. And this lady, Patricia Stankowski, they called her Pat the Hat, because she always wore baseball hats. So she died, and they asked me if I could carve her stone or not. So I was asking about her, well, tell me about something about her. They said, well, they call her Pat the Hat, because she has, wears baseball hats, so I carved, and I picked her up hitchhiking a couple of times. I had to put her walker in the back, and then she gets to the front. They hitchhike up there, they just, whoosh, you get a ride. But um, I said, yeah, okay, I'll do it. So she was telling me about it, and I said, well, what's her, I just knew it was Pat the Hat. You know, what's her real name? Patricia H. Stankowski. So, ugh. <laughs> so the eye could hardly fit, I could barely fit the eye on it. <laughs> you know. But uh, I said, well, what else about her? He said, well, when her, her and her husband divorced when her daughter was five years old. And her husband took her daughter with him and told her that her mom had died. Mm -hmm. And the only time that her daughter found out her mom wasn't dead was when she died. Mm -hmm. So Pat the Hat always asked, all her, where's my daughter? My daughter doesn't contact me, blah, blah, blah. And so I, I carved his hand coming out. And uh, her daughter in front holding, finally going to meet each other. So, and she came up to look at the uh, stone. So that's she would. I think she would enjoy that. Sasquatch. I mean, there are, and there's a full size wolf. Um, you can see in this picture the size of the stones, and he's all. And, and while I'm back here, I, I'll just mention um, the stones, like those stones, the lighter stones, like that one, this one, and the, the exhibit stone, Sam Mac, all come from a bank that was tore down in Cameron, West Virginia. And I had a show, and, and a, some fellow was there, and he said, "Hey, well, I said, where'd you get these stones?" And I told him, and he said. He thought for a while and said, huh, that's a good thing to do with banks. <laughs> and so I wrote a book, Good Thing to Do with Banks. And it's a, it has <coughs> carvings in it from the bank. And, yeah, so, uh, but that, that's, that's what the, these stones are from, Woody Guthrie. And this is a sandstone, that's not a lot. Over here is a carving that, this is the one I sold and wish I didn't. I'll give these a chance. The eagle cradling a, a dove. And I tried to get the dove to look mean, but it, I couldn't get it to look mean. It looked <laughs> peaceful. <laughs> so. And let's see, these are two fireplaces. Headstones, the main stone on fireplaces. One is, is squirrels, and this one is, a, is an eagle on it. Um, which I made, a casting. I made a casting of, and that's what this is. That's what's carved in the front of the on that stone. And I've hung it, it's, it's hanging in a lot of places. This one, I was going to take to. Uh, where they were fighting the Keystone Pipeline in uh, Dakotas. And um, I didn't, but I did carve it. And, and what it says is water is life and that's all. It just has all the, like, the, the, the salamander snails and stuff in, in the water. And on the other side, it has solar and wind and underneath by any means necessary. And don't misinterpret this as saying that I don't accept any other form or that, you know. Uh, I just thought of a carving recently to do, and I, I'm going to call it Act of Transition. And what it is, is, you know, the barges that go down a river with the coal and the sand for fracking on them, one, with the tugboat pushing it. Well, I, I think a, a carving of a tugboat that's run, running on diesel 
and gas and you know pushing these barges but the barges instead of coal and sand in them they have solar panels and wind gener and uh, windmills and so that's an active transition while we're still using diesel and, and fossil fuel energy like that use it to transition so we don't have to be stuck without it you know don't just haul coal with it why don't you haul these things you know and and we're still using coal we're still using the, the fossil fuels but we're using it to transition into another i mean we stopped using whale oil why because the whale was disappearing now that the whole planet's disappearing we don't care <laughs> so This one is, uh, it's upsetting because this is, uh, I did a carving for uh, Pieces for Peace art show, and this was my piece. And it's a tank, it's an Abrams tank that has corporate America on it, not the U.S. Army. It has corporate America. It's, and, and this is Jesus with his heart being shot right through with the tank with a round of depleted uranium. In Iraq, George Bush mentioned that we're doing Jesus' work. And by doing Jesus' work, he puts 500 tons of depleted uranium in the sands where Jesus walked. Now the Iraqi women don't ask if their child's a boy or a girl, they ask if it's normal. And, and why, and after we get out of Iraq, we end up with 13 permanent bases along the Caspian oil pipeline. It's our corporations that, that, that took us to Iraq, not any other reason. And, and it's not, the, and the truth, I have no problem with veterans, uh, you know. It's, it's the reason we have troops, I've discovered we have troops in over 130 some countries protecting over 800 American corporations. Now is that what I want my son to sign up for the military for? You know, I mean, he's doing his job and he's protecting America, but he's protecting Exxon. <laughs> yeah. so, and then this is a dove, peace, and if, if peace is gonna work, he's gotta get more. He's getting like eagle claws, which is, the stone was busted in the beginning, so I had this claw to look like the claw busted it. <laughs> but, uh, but if peace is gonna work and, 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 and get away, then it's gotta, it's gotta get stronger. And, and this is, our, our symbol of, of the United States is not what we really are. Uh, this is more appropriate. It says e pluribus bomb instead of e pluribus unum. And, and it's, uh, instead of the olive branch, we got religion up here as, as a reason to bomb people. And down here, he's, the claw, he's got the, that's where the olive branch was. Here he's got a dove that he's squishing, and nuclear arms in that one. And there's tears coming out of the eagle's eyes because he don't want to be a symbol of that. You know, the eagle doesn't want to be a symbol of that, period. And, uh, but that's more appropriate to where we are. With everything, I don't know how, how you folks feel, but when you get up in the morning and listen to news, yeah, every story is about a different country, a war, killing, it's just bizarre things. I mean, an earthquake killing more people than were killed in the Vietnam War? You know, it's like, and we don't pay any attention to that. Like, like I thought about the School of America. That's not, it's not important. And, and so something has to something has to change. I mean, I don't know exactly where it is. I'm not uh, influential, but but that's just. And, and in relation to that, is this uh, carving which I took listening to the news at night, and we heard oh, there's a lady, Cindy Sheehan, down in, in George Bush's backyard, uh, carving uh, in a puck tent. And she's not going to leave until she's told by George Bush why her son was killed. And so I got up in the morning and I said, I'm going to Texas. I put that stone on there in my truck and I went down to Texas. There wasn't a pup tent in the ditch. There were like 10,000 people. There was a big circus tent. And, and, there were more, and I'm thinking about why, why would that news report say there's one lady in a pup tent? And, and I figured it out. It's, they don't want the people to know that there's that many people against the war. You know what I mean? They didn't want to bring that 
that up. They wanted to maintain the fact that we're there for good reason. Yeah. Yeah. But on the bottom here are 40, 28 names of people who were killed, soldiers in Iraq, and I talked to every one of their parents because they were there uh, before I carved their names. And I could hardly carve them. It was just tear jerking. And, and then I'd, I'd carve a name like Matthew and John and Jesus. And it's like, wait, wait, I'm, I gotta find a different name here. <laughs> this is too. <laughs> so, uh, but the stories they told her, just, and, and I'll just tell one, it, uh, Father Carlos, his son was on Carlos, his, his birthday, on Father's birthday, two Marines came up to his door and said, your son was killed in Iraq. They wouldn't leave. So he got really upset and, and uh, he went out and he busted their car up. They wouldn't leave. He got gasoline, poured it all over their car, lit it, caught himself on fire. His mother come out of the house trying to put him out. And Carlos's son, who was killed, his brother, Carlos's other son, got a call in his apartment, said, turn the news on, turn. He turned the news on, saw his dad on fire, his grandmother putting him out, and the announcer talking about how he just heard that his son was killed in Iraq. He attempted suicide, the other son. And, and Carlos was at the uh, finish line at the uh, uh, Boston Marathon when the bomb went off, and he saved the guy's life who lost both his legs, who became the symbol of Boston Strong. And he didn't do very well as a symbol of Boston Strong. He was drinking, he was on drugs, he was too... So Carlos called him up and said, meet me at this restaurant. He told him his story that I just told you. I, that guy stopped drinking the meat. He said, I'm worried about my legs. You know, look what happened to this guy. Yeah. So, but it was a really interesting. And on the lighter side, I got to hug Joan Baez. Uh, <laughs> Daniel Ellsberg, I brought tears to his eyes when they unveiled this carving at the Crawford Peace House. He had tears coming out of his eyes. And, uh, uh, documentaries were made. It was an incredible experience. And Let's see. Okay. These are like commissioned works where for people's yards where they want their name, the Wallace family and the Needy family. And when I get uh, calls like that, I, I just meet with them and I talk with them. And, and then when I leave, I put in, in the carving what like Blair ne uh, Neely, he makes wine, so I carved a grapevine dripping into bottles with the grapes dripping into bottles and it morphs on the other side into a pepper plant with peppers come down and it's white like the canned peppers. And this, when I delivered this one and set it up, the, the lady looked at me and she said, boy oh, Ron, that's beautiful, that would make a nice tombstone. In a week or I did not. Oh. So I said, I ain't carved that thing. And then I caught it. <laughs> and there's another casting fish. This is my brother. His name is Worm. His name is Worm since he was five years old. No one even knows his real name. <laughs> and, uh, but he was an artist, very good artist, one of the Chicago Art Institute. And, uh, they cleaned all the graffiti off of old Chicago uh, mm -hmm. and left his left his arm because it was beautiful. And um, he was uh, he was drafted, went to Vietnam and came back and that's where he went to art school. And uh, but about when he was 37, 38, he uh, ended up falling out of a car going 70 miles an hour. Oh, and uh, that's about what happened. But the um, the interesting thing is, and we buried him. Well, here's the, here's the thing. A fellow in Cameron, who was 100% Cree Indian, told me, he said, Ron, he said, my two sons died within three weeks of each other, and I was just diagnosed with cancer. Could you come down and carve a monument for my two boys? And uh, I said, sure, Rocky. I said, I'll come down. So I went down. I said, well, tell me about your sons. Tell me about Robert. He said, well, Robert was a good athlete. He, he went to college, played ball for a couple of years, and for one year, and quit, was drafted to Vietnam, where he contacted Agent Orange. His fiance spent all his money that he was sending her when he was in Vietnam, 
And he come out, he went to art school, and he showed me the spear points that he made, with flints, and it was incredible. And uh, he said, and when, when he died, we buried him, and a red-tailed hawk flew up from the grave and followed us halfway home. And I'm shaking like, look, he's wrong, what's the matter? I said, Brock, when is, when is his birthday? He said, November 2nd, 1950, and I lost him. He said, what is wrong, Ron? I said, Rock, Rocky, I got a brother named Rock. And he's in the Hall of Fame athlete, high school athletics. He went to college to play ball. After one year, he dropped out, was immediately drafted to Vietnam, where he contacted Agent Orange. His fiance spent his money, married somebody else while he was there. When he got out, he went to art school, Chicago. When he died, a crow flew up from the grave and followed us halfway home. And his birthday, November 2nd, 1950. Now, I can see one or two of those things happening, but, but it just reinforces the fact that I may not be very religious, but spirituality is, exists. You know, I'm convinced of that. And, uh, to this day, he shows up as a crow. He, uh, our place in Della Coola, crow, I got pictures of a crow sitting right on, comes in the house right, right in the front door, sitting there all the time, and, and a lady was staying in our house, and I was talking to her, I said, how's it going up there? Well, she says, well, your brother's here every day. He comes in the house. <laughs> but he, he's an incredible artist. So, uh, let's see. I think other than that, um, on the back, like I said, there's, there's a, on the, on the table, it's like, like I said, feel free to walk around and, and really that man. Jim Little Horse from Bella Coola, British Columbia, and um, he's a musician, and he had a CD with a picture of him on the CD with his back like going down the road. So that's what I carved, and one of his songs was about going on down the road after you die, you just go on down the road. So I put on down the road with him walking up with a peace sign on the road. And everyone kept asking me, where's Jesus? Where's Jesus? I said, where's the Jim Little Horse's stone? It's not Jesus' stone. They said, yeah, but you know, he really was into Jesus the last few weeks. I said, oh, okay. So I continued the road, on his name, down over the other side, and, and I put Jesus on the other side. And, and after I carved it, a few native folks were walking down the road. I said, hey, come over here. I said, I want to cheat. They go, oh, look, it's Jesus. I said, oh, that's what I wanted. Thank you. Said, yeah, I wanted to see if you recognize who that was. <laughs> so. uh, but this, <clears throat> I, got, I got tired of people telling me I'm a hypocrite because you drive a car, you use electricity. You you know, so I carved the Grim Reaper with the earth being destroyed by him, but instead of a face, I put a mirror. Mm -hmm. Everybody looks at this carving, sees himself as the Grim Reaper. <laughs> <laughs> and we're all guilty. Uh, you know, so when someone says, you're, you're a hypocrite, I said, you should look at that. <laughs> yeah, that's clever. <laughs> but that comes from the bank. So what's, what's really neat is that picture of the bank on my book. I look at it, and I see Woody Guthrie under this side of the arch. <laughs> and Luke, Luke Zimlick, the chief, on the other side, that's what's holding the arch up now. And, and, and I found out that Woody Guthrie is part Native American, too. So it's, it's kind of interesting. And, and on this one corner, it's this now. And so, so when a guy says, oh, that's a good thing to do with banks. I'm not sure all banks would agree. <laughs> Uh, it's called Hungry Hook. That's, what the, that's the, where, where uh, we used to go on picnics, and then one time we saw this piece of land, and uh, it had caves and a creek, and it was beautiful. I thought, so we went back and called the owner, and she was willing to sell us a piece, and I figured it was about 30 acres. It turned out to be 34 acres. So, and, and where, I, where we were living is a place where you didn't need money. So everybody lived there on like 14, 15 grand a year, like kings. Rich folks with no money. And uh, 
So something like this comes up. What? How do we get the money to pay for it? Well, I built a four-foot toolbox out of plywood, took my banjo strap off my banjo, put it on the toolbox, and went to D.C. and walked in on a concrete garage they were building, four corners, and uh, I talked to the boss. I said, I like the job here. He's looking at me. He looked down. He looked at me. He goes, where are you from, West Virginia? No. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. You know, and, uh, see, yeah, so I worked for four months and made nothing and quit. Paid that off, and that's how we lived for 35 years or so. Uh, and and uh, it wasn't bad. What it did is it brought me into uh, learning a dozen different skills. And and, uh, and no, we weren't, now everybody, like I said, everybody's uh, poor folks with lots of money. No. Uh, but here's hung, Hungry Hook. This is where, uh, where we lived. Hungry Hook. I live in a hollow known as Hungry Hook piece of heaven now invaded by crooks. A place known for its peace and beauty to rape is now corporate America's duty. Hickory, hazel, and walnut too add flavor to a venison stew, while turkey, squirrel, and rabbit with ramps all supply our nourishment. Add syrup made from the maple tree to sassafras and wild mint tea, and when it's time to celebrate, fine wines are had from berries and wild grapes. Hawks, fox, coyotes, grouse, and deer are treasured sights throughout the year. With a lion, bobcat, and bear passing through, locals see this as the Hungry Hook Zoo. Morels, sheep's head, and oyster shelf shrooms are picked throughout the year, but it's the hunt for ginseng in the fall that we all hold so dear. A waterfall and a hand dug well keeps us all clean with buckets to fill, but coal and gas ripped from this hollow will deplete and pollute for the almighty dollar. The sounds I now hear outside my cabin door is clanging and drilling and not a thing more. Mm. There's no rustling of leaves, chirps, yips, or growls. Fascist corporate greed trumps them all somehow. Now I must leave my home built by hand with plenty of hope I'll travel other lands in search of a place that I can call home, in search of a hungry hope elsewhere I'll roam. <coughs> fighting it legally or something, but when you talk to the actual people who are affected by it, uh, it, just, it, it just aligns you with the uh, indigenous groups and what happened to them. Same thing. And, and apparently for the same reason. <laughs> but, oh, and over here, <clears throat> is, this is the carving of wheeling that I have actual carving and, and this and, uh, this one is the last one I did for um, political things it's called our symbol of justice except uh, she doesn't she's not carrying us so she's carrying her back scratcher <laughs> and, uh, and if money's on one end of the scale nothing's going to level it out and, uh, and she's not blind she's got one eye open and she's got a pig nose because she's turned very greedy, and it's a joke, and it's all carried out with Jack Boot authority, and I call it Miss Justice. And, uh, and, and people can get mad at, at carving something like that, but tell me it's not true. <laughs> and, and it's a butterfly, and, and it's this one, which I guess you can you can all guess what this is. Captain's pig. And, uh, I make castings of it, and there's one uh, one around here somewhere. Yeah, over there. And uh, I send them to CEOs of corporations. I've sent one to Smithfield Foods CEO because he went to Poland and hired peasants in Poland to go around and buy up all the pig farms and give it to Smithfield Foods, who owns all the pork farm. They built a pig farm there that's so toxic, that all the water's polluted, they do nothing about it, you can smell it from an airplane, and they have the, they have the uh, control of all the pork in the European Union because of that. You know, and just took it away from all those people. He deserves that. And I sent another one to Caterpillar, CEO of Caterpillar, because George Bush is sitting on the same Caterpillar bulldozer that run, out, run over Rachel Quarry in Palestine. 
he's sitting on there, fire up horns, this is great. You know, no, that's not great. So I said, you know, why are you selling giant tanks to Israel? You know, the, the war machine. And that's, that's the problem, I think, in the world is, is how much money every, all these countries are making, selling weapons, making weapons, and using weapons. And, you know, it, just, it just blows me away. So I, I sent him one, but um, I've got a few more in mind. <laughs> But I think that's it. I think I covered everything. So if you have any questions, feel free to ask. But uh, for the rest of the time, just feel free to walk around and, and look at, like I said, read some of them posters. And, How long does it take you to make these? That's things? the most common question I get. And, and, and my answer is always the same. I don't know. Because <laughs> <laughs> I don't just sit and do one till it's done. So for me to like keep track every time I sit down to do it, I'm, oh, what time is it? And when I get done, okay, what time? I don't do that. And, and uh, as Confucius says, find something you like to do and you'll never have to work a day in your life. And if you enjoy something like that, you don't look at the time. You're just enjoying the carving and listening to music, and, you know, and, and you could care less how much time it takes. <laughs>